Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I met you last weekend, was it last weekend, the weekend before, um, the last training weekend we had, and um, we did had some fun exploring some Alexander ideas. That's so exactly. you've got a lot of questions for me, but I've got some questions for you. <laughs> oh boy! Let's see if they um, let's see if they come out. Great, great. Um, well, maybe we could start just with the the question that I ask everybody, which is sort of who are you? What's your life story and background? In whatever detail you'd like to share, long, short, any way you'd like, but sort of introducing yourself and your background and your life history. Well, I immediately think of um, what Alan Watts said about mm. if someone asks, if you're listening to music and someone asks who you are, if you're really here, you'll say the music. Mm. And um, I will tell you my life background. Does somehow only very few bits of it are relevant. I was born in 1959, that makes me 63, in a lovely, tiny little monocultural village in Wales, um, where everyone was called Peter or Jane or Sarah or John. There were two John Davises in the school. And um, I was sent to boarding school in England when I was 10. I went to the University of East Anglia in 1970 seven and I studied biological sciences, I specialized in genetics and I moved to London and worked in retail management for 10 years. Um, and then I discovered this Alexander thing. My teacher said I had uh, a talent for it. She asked whether I'd ever thought about training and I thought this sounds like a good idea. And, and retail management, that office work, getting cross with people who were late for work really wasn't my thing. And uh, I discovered Alexander, um, started teaching it in 1993 and have never looked back. Someone, um, a friend of mine who is older and more experienced and wiser in the ways of the world than me, says that in his experience, a job lasts five years. Well, I've been teaching it since 1993. I've actually been teaching it in the same office since probably 2000. And uh, it, it hasn't run out of, it, uh, it hasn't ended because new meanings keep opening up, new ideas, new ways of presenting it. I was thinking about how, um, I, I, um, well, I'm going to tell you how I got interested in the Alexander technique. Is this an appropriate time to? I, I, I was a very shy person, and I was very good at pretending that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up thinking I was a misfit. I, I would go to parties and sit in the kitchen and watch people and wonder um, why they were so confident. Why are they so confident? Why is that man so confident? Or, um, and I would wonder, what do people actually say to each other? I thought I was some kind of misfit. I only discovered about five, ten years ago, I'm an introvert. I'm not a misfit at all. I'm just an introvert. And, uh, but th in those days, I was painfully shy and an introvert. And that isn't a good combination. But I also had a funny walk. My friends teased me about my walk. And I met someone who'd um, uh, uh, who'd been a nurse who tried to catch someone falling out of bed and had broken her back. Mm. And she had part of her vertebra removed. It turned out she knew one of my neighbours and the neighbour said, oh, Joan, yeah, she came round and showed us her vertebra. And the, But this nurse, ex-nurse, said that um, when she was learning to walk again, she'd done this thing called the Alexander Technique. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And it had helped her learn to walk again, and it had helped her, um, a side benefit was that she was more self-confident. Hmm. So I went for my first lesson. I told the teacher I wanted to learn to walk properly, but my secret agenda was that I wanted to be more confident. Hmm. And actually the, the Alexander's technique is, is um, known for physical benefits. The benefits that I've got from it, the physical benefits are minuscule compared with the mental and spiritual benefits of it. So I think that'll do for my life story. Hmm. How, how have you changed from 
the Alexander technique, can you describe in a little bit more detail what sort of the mental and spiritual benefits have been? The mental and spiritual. Well, I, if, if we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, no, no, mental and spiritual. Okay. When I, before I discovered Alexander, when I was in my twenties, um, I was once given magic mushrooms by a yoga teacher that I trusted. And um, we took mushrooms, not enough to hallucinate, but the whole evening and nights, I went to bed at five o'clock in the morning, I could see with absolute clarity. London at night after it's rained and the air is clear, um, you can see lights for miles and miles and miles. And it was like that. And the yoga teacher said, some people live in this higher state of consciousness. Mm. And at the time, in my early 20s, having never done anything like this, I thought that it sounded like a load of hippie nonsense. But now I live in that um, higher state of consciousness mm. that uh, I am occupying that, uh, that sort of space. Um, I wrote down something. And I can't open my notebook. Hmm. It's an electronic one, that's why. <laughs> Something else that changed for me. So I've gone, I've gone more, more confident. What's changed? Things that I expected would diminish as I got older have improved. Some my friend's mother, who was in her 80s, told me that of her friends, her closest friends are the friends she made as a child. And for me, um, my I, the things that have one some of the things that have changed with the Alexander technique is that I've got better at things I was bad at at school, mm. like self confidence, uh, creativity. I'm now fizzing with creativity in mm. a way that I wasn't at school. Um, Humour, and um, I've met and uh, I've made. I make friendships now in my 50s and 60s that I didn't expect to make and probably wasn't capable of making when I was a child. And also we played, did we play catch? Mm -hmm. That if I knew at school how little needs to be done to mm. throw and catch or kick or hit something with a stick, I would have been in all sports teams instead mm. of being the person who was picked last. So that's the kind of thing that has changed mm. for me. Mm. Would you say that your personality has changed? Well, that's a good question. I, and I think personality sort of changes over time anyway. Mm -hmm. But I say I've got a lot less complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to grumble about um, Toller's book, The Power of Now, at some point. Mm. where. Toller said that when he learned to be in the here and now, he was in a state of bliss for two years, sitting on park benches in a state of bliss for two years. Well, I'm pretty good at being in the here and now, mm. and uh, there's nothing blissful about it. Mm. It just mm. is. Um, but when I think back to what a ball of fear and complication and um, insecurity I was, and how I lived my life doing things that I thought other people would do or what other people expected of me. This is pretty good. And I wonder whether habits like that get worse as we get older, you know, we get more set in our ways. Mm. So to have to have sort of liberated myself from, I was going to say all those habits, to be on a journey of liberating myself from those, those habits is, is pretty good. It's not bliss though. Who was your Alexander Technique teacher and what did your training involve? Who, who was? Well, the, I had some lessons um, with the, um, a very traditional Alexander teacher. And, um, and then I decided to train. And at that time in the late eighties, but the Alexander Technique was so well known that most of the training schools had a waiting list. Hmm. You had to apply, you had to get to know the teacher, and um, and when there was a vacancy, they would let people in. Um, 
my teacher told me to go and visit all the schools and find someone that I was happy to work with, felt that I would be happy to work with for three years. This is advice I still give to people. And so I went and visited them all. Unfortunately, the place where I felt I would get on best was the place that had the smallest waiting, smallest waiting list. Mm. And I was training there three months later. Um, someone who um, uh, had done a traditional training, but had worked with people from all sorts of backgrounds and come to a sort of synthesis of uh, all the different approaches to teaching it. Mm. The Alexander Technique, I've said already, the Alexander Technique is perceived as being something physical. I'm on a bit of a mission. I mean, F.M. Alexander himself said it's about unity of mind, body and spirit, unity of mind, body and spirit. And I'm on a bit of a mission to uh, get the Alexander world to, and to get the world to see the Alexander Technique differently. Mm. The majority of people haven't heard of it. Um, and when they have, well, I was uh, in a car with an acquaintance and um, uh, there was a journalist in the car who worked for The Guardian because I'd never miss an opportunity for marketing. I said, do you know about the Alexander Technique? He said, oh, the Alexander Technique, that's like divining, like with two sticks, isn't it? <laughs> and actually, I have had uh, articles in, I've been, to, I've been interviewed in The Guardian and various other um, magazines and newspapers and I'm not going to say which one it was but I was at a tango I was at a tango class and I was introduced to the health editor of one of these publications and I said to her very nicely I was misquoted in your magazine the journalist and I agreed the copy and a sub-editor changed it and put the word posture in it Mm. It's really not about posture. Why don't you come and have a lesson? You can have one free and I'll show you what it's really about. And her friend who was listening asked, what is this Alexandra technique? <laughs> and the editor said, it's about posture. <laughs> but even though I've just said it isn't, <laughs> I've got a bit of a mission to uh -huh. wake, up the, wake up the world to what FM discovered and the potential um, it has for changing the world, not just ourselves, but change, changing the world in all sorts of ways. Um, FM Alexander felt it would put an end to wars. If enough people learn this, it would put an end to wars. Mm -hmm. We can come back to that later. Mm. What, given that there's these sort of widespread misconceptions or maybe limiting definitions of what it is and what it's about, how would you describe what Alexander Technique is and what it's about? Okay. Um, Alexander teaches, Put on their websites pictures of small children to illustrate the beautiful physical functioning they've got. They squat, they move uh, in a balanced way, um, even though their heads are so much bigger than their spines in, in relationship to, to, you know, compared to us relatively. And um, they do indeed. I see small children, I think, well, I'd love to move like that. We, we, which I'm going to attack this from this angle or from this angle and then come around in a circle. So we go for our Alexander lesson and we discover this fabulous light and easy. Did you, did you experience being lighter and easier? And, and we go off and we say to people, oh, it's so cool. I was, I felt physically lighter. I was so light. I couldn't feel my body, that kind of thing. It's much easier to notice the physical benefits but we're we are born perfect um i believe we're born with uh, mind body and spirit completely one and then we for various reasons we diminish it we separate mind body and spirit so what we're getting back is what small children have got. But what have small children got? In addition to the beautiful physical functioning, they've got an interest in the world around them, a curiosity about the world around them. And uh, they are built in, they are learning machines. They will just learn. Uh, they have a wide range of embodied emotions, emotions that they move on from very quickly. They have humor how many times a day do children laugh they have creativity picasso said all children are artists the problem is 
getting them to stay that way. They dance like no one's watching. They sing like no one's listening. Uh, there's more unconditional love. Who wouldn't want to get all that back? And that is what Alexander, the, uh, uh, the, the Alexander technique teaches. Unfortunately, it's so easy to only notice the physical. And I think over three or four generations of teachers, the, I mean, I have evidence I'm writing about this, that the first generation of teachers, a group of them, were, were cross with FM Alexander because he wasn't teaching them how to get the full physical benefits. Mm -hmm. If you're an Alexander teacher watching this, I know that that's a summary, um, an oversimplification. He wasn't teaching them how to get the full physical benefits, so they worked out how to do it for themselves, but he wasn't teaching them that. He was teaching them how to get back all these other things that would involve creativity and. So that group of teachers, and then it's got increasingly turned into body work over the years, in, in my opinion. Now, I'm happy for anyone who has a different opinion to tell me so, but only if you've read and understood F.M. Alexander's books. Hmm. And my the book I'm currently writing is um, How to Make Sense of F.M. Alexander's books. Hmm. This is an interesting mismatch. The majority of Alexander teachers are not, in my experience, teaching what's in the books. And the majority of Alexander teachers think the books are difficult or uh, god awful or FM didn't know how to write or I I I, I would approach them from the other point approach the books from the other point of view find out what's in the books and then you might have to change what you do hmm. Hmm. so that's what I'm that's what I'm writing about hmm. so if I'm hearing this correctly the way that you think about the Alexander technique is it's fundamentally about mind, body, spirit, unity, and the physical changes are simply a byproduct of that, but they're easier to notice. So people have sort of glommed onto that uh, because it's, it's, it's obvious compared to the subtle changes that have to do with this unity. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, one of the teachers that I trained, he was a, uh, also a, a psychologist um, when I, I play catch with people and I ask how they're doing it differently mm. they frequently say um, it's more relaxed mm. so I point out to them that other things are different too and this psychologist said you shouldn't ask people questions and then feed them the answer mm. but the reason I feed them the answer is that they don't look in the right place mm. So how are you different? Well, I'm more relaxed. Oh, well, that's interesting. If you ask someone to show you what relaxed is like, they won't look like this. They'll do a sort of look. It's a really alive, alert kind of relaxedness. Yes, that's true. And it's a relaxedness of mind and body. Yes, that's true. And actually, you have, and you might agree with this because you've tried it, when, it, when, when we're in that Alexander zone, we have less awareness of self and more awareness of what's outside mm -hmm. ourselves now if i don't point that out most people don't notice it mm -hmm. so it's really easy to go away um uh only thinking of the physical benefits mm -hmm. and i've started in a first lesson as, as saying to people at the end you are lighter aren't you yes mm -hmm. you are more aware of <laughs> outside you aren't you <laughs> getting there yet because of this strange thing that happens like people do this and I tell them to go and live in a bigger space. So they do that. And they come back the following week and they're doing this. And they say, you told me to look around. <laughs> no, no, that isn't what we did. And I made you say, you are more aware of space, aren't you? Yes. We go away and we try to make the change using what we already do. Mm. This is why self-help books don't work mm. or are, are unlikely to work. I wrote in my book, available on Amazon and all other, <laughs> all from me, way, Mindfulness in 3D. There's, a, there's um, a, a management book written by an Alexander teacher called Lessons from the Art of Juggling. Hmm. And the premise of the book is take these three balls, teach yourself to juggle, but watch how you do it, because how you learn to juggle is how you do everything. Hmm. I divide the world up into three kinds of people, thinkers, doers, and procrastinators. 
I originally wrote in my book, Thinkers, Doers and Slobs, but the editor told me I couldn't say that. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm one of them. I should know. Thinkers, doers and procrastinators. Thinkers say, right, teach myself to juggle. OK, I'm just going to watch some YouTube videos and I'm going to read the book again. And doers say, right, I'm going to get up half an hour early every day and I'm going to get this done within a week. And procrastinators say, I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> so we read self-help books and it says, you know, be in the here and now. It doesn't tell you how to do it. Mm. Um, thinkers say, OK, I'm going to be in the here and now. Right. Yes. And, and doers say, right, I'm going to get myself in the here and now and I'm going to practice five times a day. It doesn't work. The thing that needs to change is the thinking or the doing or the procrastinating. That is the thing that needs to change for change to happen, for us to be able to apply what we read in self-help books. We, we need to change the how we do things. And Alexander teaches us how to become aware of the how. And in an Alexander lesson, we I invite you into a zone where you are not thinking or doing or procrastinating, you are just being. Mm. And in that, we can make new choices and change. Mm. What kinds of things? That was a long I... one. I'm was just that... gonna have a sip of tea. I heard the utterly fabulous Terry Pratchett being interviewed once. I, I, I was there and he was asked a question twice and he did a 15 minute reply. And at the end of both of those, he said, well, that was a good answer. I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> so I can have a sip of tea. Um, Done. Yeah. I can multitask. I can ask a question. I can listen to a question as I sip my tea. Uh -huh. what, what, um, what does an in-person lesson with you involve typically? I think, I think to answer that, I need to say something more about unity. Mm. And my, my if, you, if you've read Mindfulness in 3D, you'll know that my role model, Alexander person is my cat, Sigmund. Mm -hmm. cats, are, cats have perfect, um, what we call use, the way they use themselves, themselves, not their bodies. Mind, body and spirit are completely coordinated. Um, and, uh, I, um, my cat Sigmund would sit at the top of the stairs and I would throw him a cork above his head and he would jump up and catch it, put it in his mouth, turn over and land on a lower stair with all four feet at the same time. Now we could argue that his mind made a decision to and his body something, but how did, how did he decide where to? How did he know where the cook was to catch it the uh, observing bit of him the deciding bit of him and the actioning bit of him all worked as one now the human equivalent is a, a racing driver that i used to teach who said that when he's racing there isn't time to think there isn't time to think and, and yet a lot of thinking goes on at 300 kilometers per hour and the observing part of him, the deciding part of him, the actioning part of him, and the adrenaline part of him are working as one without the mediation or interpretation of a layer of thinking. Compared to some of the worst drivers I've ever sat next to, who do drive through a layer of thinking and mediation. Um, oh, hang on, there's a red light, hang on. I better just I better stop taking attention down into their foot to or hang on hang on I had to stop talking hang on hang on I'm going to change lane can't listen and change lane because it has to go oh is it safe to all mediated through layers of words and um and so separating the observational bit the decision making bit and the actioning bit so in my experience everything works better when we get out of all the way and allow our unified system to do everything for us. So my role in an Alexander lesson is to find a way to get that across to the person I'm teaching. And there's a different way in, there's a different way in for everyone. 
Uh, someone recently, I wonder if you were there when this happened. My find a way of getting it across to people. And one of the one of the ways in which it works is that somehow we're really good at resonating off what other people are doing. My trainees hate seeing me do this, mm. but let's do it anyway. I'm gonna switch off my Alexander mm. and you'll see my posture will change. He says sarcastically, I'm gonna switch off my... Have, Tashin, have you seen me do this? Yes, yes, multiple times. Was it enjoyable? No, it was extremely uncomfortable. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Interesting, but I, not. I, my body I, felt bad. I disliked you and I didn't trust you all of a sudden. Isn't that nowhere. interesting? Isn't yes. that interesting? Yes. Because, because I've heard before yeah, it's not enjoyable. And I've heard before my, my body felt bad, but I've never heard distrust and, uh, and dislike. Yeah, and well, and notably, I do like you and trust you, but then when you, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it, it was like, oh, suddenly uh, this is a different person. <laughs> well, let's see if this works over Zoom. Yeah. I'll take my glasses off. No, I'll leave my glasses on. I'm going to switch off that. You feel it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've now I've switched off, Alexander. I'm not actually communicating with you. Oh, now I'm going to engage that layer of thinking. I'm just going to reach for my teeth. I'm just going to reach for my... You feel this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I switch it on in one go like that, then you get a sort of hit of it. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Amazingly, or you'll probably find this amazing, some people don't notice the difference. Mm, mm -hmm. And someone came at the weekend that you were at who had come for, to get relief from physical aches and pains and she couldn't see the difference in me. Mm. So with someone like that, the, 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 the goal they want is not to learn something about consciousness, they want to be in less pain. Mm. And if we send them off with strategies for moving differently, strategies for moving in ways that don't cause pain, that's a win and they're happy. Mm. So, um, but if they come back, uh, gradually they pick up on whatever whatever's happening here. What 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 is this the answer to a question? What question is this the answer to? I'm getting my teapot. How what do I do in a lesson? Yeah, what do you do in lesson? And and and, and maybe now like what, what are some of the different ways that you do get it across? Like certainly the sort of turning it off, turning it on thing, but what, what are some other ways that you well, my job it? while I'm what my job while I'm training teachers or teaching it one to one is to stay like this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually matter what we do in a lesson. Mm. What matters is how we go about it. Remember what I said, we're changing the how we do things. We're learning to change the how we do things. And more importantly, that, if, that I stay like this. Mm -hmm. Because as long as I'm like this, you will um, uh, be invited to resonate or whatever and, and come into this zone with me. So my job for 45 odd minutes in a one-to-one -one is to stay like this. Mm. Or over a training weekend to stay like this for... 20 hours mm -hmm. i sleep I, I sleep well on sunday nights at the end of a training weekend because i've been putting energy into but interestingly this is a bit of a diversion and i'll rely on you to get us back on mm -hmm. track if that's what um i've just been doing a, a zoom class with someone overseas a zoom lesson and we were talking about how for me this takes no effort and if I want to narrow my focus down into here, this takes quite a lot of effort. Mm. This, this doesn't look like me, but this is what people do, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this is not unusual, but this is taking me a lot of effort. And when I let go of the effort, I bounce back out to this thing. Mm. New people, this is easier for them, and they have to put effort into this, into choosing it. And when they stop putting effort in, they go back to that. So my job, oh, and the more time we spend in this zone, the, I can't prove this, but this is my experience of teaching it to people over time that they, you know, here's a graph. If we spend 45 minutes in this zone, they will never go back to where they originally were. Mm -hmm. 
And the more we time we spend in this, uh, the easier it gets to choose, the easier it is to notice when, when we've lost it. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing people, I, if they've come for pain, they just want a strategy for moving without causing pain. But if they want to learn the full works, um, the over time, well, I've forgotten what I was going to say. We're, I'm, I'm teaching people to make choices about what they're doing with their consciousness. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I saw you do were like, um, yeah, you mentioned playing catch, and I also saw you uh, like dancing with people, and I saw you. Uh, there's also something and we can talk about this in some more detail, but like putting your hand near someone's back or or on their back and and interacting with them in that way. Um, what are sort of the what's happening there? I I, I get what you're saying about um, you know it's important that the most important thing is that you stay there in this place but uh what's what are these sort of I, I, i'll tell you about the hand first and then i'll okay. tell you about the dancing okay great the hand really um because this, this works over zoom mm -hmm. it for most people it works slightly better if we're there mm -hmm. partly because it's not mediated through mm -hmm. and partly because with a hand on when i make that choice for myself my hands change Someone at the weekend asks about this. We have one of those big gym balls, Pilates balls, whatever they're called. And I got the person who asked to put his hand on the ball. And I put my hands on the ball, but scrunched. And as I let go like that, he said the ball started tingling. That somehow one of the things we pick up on is what, what good muscle tone feels like and so we sort of resonate to that it also helps me guide people into movement and it helps a third thing which is it gives me feedback about change so if we're going to learn to do things differently one of the one of the difficulties with learning to do things differently is when we change activity Let's be, so I'm imagining, I'm teaching someone this, let's be in this zone. Now let's walk over to the window. Oh, okay. And when they change activity, they organize themselves to go over to the window. It's the point of giving themselves permission to go. I heard that in the Wild West, in shootouts, the person who drew first tended to lose mm. because the decision-making responding to a decision pathway is slower than the responding to something we've seen pathway. Mm. Mm. So if someone decides to go over to the window, they will probably go and they will tend to organize it. But if initially I show them how there can be no change, if I invite them to go, it's easy for them to stay in this zone. What do you mean by organize in this case? Well, I, I, I tell you um, that the racing driver is not organizing himself. The, the scary drivers are organizing themselves. The, oh, I need to break. I've just organized that. Mm. The seeing something and wordlessly breaking, that is being organized by the system. If that, if that doesn't um, explain it, when Sigmund sees a mouse, he doesn't go, oh, a mouse, right, I'll get ready to jump. I, I'm, just, I'm parsing uh, this as, as like using thoughts and muscles to intend something that dissipates the unity. Yes. The, yes. When we play catch, when I play catch with people the first time, those of you who haven't done it, um, what what we did was we we played catch i asked you how i was doing it differently and then i told you how i was doing it differently and that was i wasn't looking at the ball i was keeping eye contact mm -hmm. now i can't remember the details of what happened with you but it is astonishing how when people stop organizing themselves to throw and catch and they come back to this mm -hmm. and keep eye contact and stop aiming mm -hmm. It is astonishing how often it goes straight to my hands. Hmm. It's interesting. I, when I played catch with you, with the interventions you made, I, I was it was easier for me to catch it 
then to throw it, I had a hard time throwing it, uh, which makes well, me I think about this West shootout thing. Exactly. That's just what I thought. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. interesting. I'm going to show you one of my favorite books because here I am on the fringes of something alternative. Mm -hmm. I just can show you a multi a multitasking. For the last five or eight years, I have written in my online calendar when I hear the first bird song in the spring, mm. what the birds are and what the date, what year it was. And I have just heard the first swifts go mm. past. I haven't seen them yet, but I've heard them. Mm. Um, so multitasking. Mm. This book is... Ten Zen Questions. Mm. It was by Susan Blackmore. It was subsequently published as Zen in the Art of Consciousness. Blackmore is a scientist who is interested in the nature of consciousness. That's what she writes about. And um, I love this book. And there's a bit in here that explains the catching. I've read it to people so many times. Mm that I can probably do it without looking, but I'm going to read it to you. Imagine that some, this, this was written for me. Imagine that someone throws you a ball and you reach up and catch it neatly. The natural and tempting way to think about this simple action is to imagine that first you consciously notice the ball coming towards you and judge its speed and position. And then you consciously control the movements of your arms and hands to catch it. And that's what I used to do until I discovered Alexander. Oh, someone's throwing me a ball. Okay, I've got to keep an eye on it. And I'm going to, that is me organizing myself to catch the ball. She says, it's as though you are sitting somewhere inside your head, experiencing events and then deciding how to respond. It's a form of Cartesian material, materialism involving a little me inside who's having a stream of conscious experiences and acting upon them. Quite apart from philosophical doubts, the science tells us it cannot be like this. The visual system consists of as many as 40 parallel pathways taking different routes through the brain. Among these are two main paths, the dorsal stream that controls fast actions and the slower ventral stream that perceives and recognizes objects. So if you're playing tennis, riding a bike or catching that ball, your dorsal stream will ensure that you catch the ball long before you can have seen that a ball was coming. Now, when I, I think of the implications of that, we get out of the way and let the system do it. But we think that we have to go, oh, um, so your dorsal stream and your ventral stream, make sure you caught the ball. But to throw it back, you know, you will res you let your dorsal stream and your ventral stream by the way, we don't need to know science for Alexander to work. It's just nice to, to have it back up what, um, what I teach. That you responded to the ball, allowing your ventral stream and your dorsal stream to organize it, but then you had to make a choice, and that was more difficult. Mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's I can feel you thinking. Let's come back to this bigger thing. Go and have a look around. Mm. Yeah, turn your head, then you'll break the spell. Ah, now you're breathing again. Right? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> it's my job. I can't, I, I can't help it. No, actually, I can. <laughs> so, in my, in my experience about small children, that the, the that um, the, the getting people to dance. Actually, what I was do, getting them to do was 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 slightly be silly. Mm -hmm. I was getting them out of control. I wanted to move them. When people are getting stuck and thinky, this is trainee and Alexander teachers, they get stuck and thinky. And I say, move or whatever. And they get, I want to move them around in such a way that they don't have time to get the organizing bits mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, involved in organizing it. Mm -hmm. These things like um, catching works better when we're not involved. Uh, creativity works better when we're not involved. The, mm -hmm. The that um, the racing driver. Did I tell you about my daughter and I used to keep chickens? My daughter and I used to keep chickens, mm. and the the chickens made themselves a dust bath under our picnic table, and sat in it, dusting their feathers and contentedly vocalizing to each other. And my daughter asked whether I thought they were happy, and um, I said, oh, I think that right now 
everything is how it should be. They're not hungry. They don't have to run away from anything. They're dusting, but they haven't got the self-observatory part of the mind that can say, oh, look, I'm happy. Right now, I'm happy. And we have got that bit. And we use it. Um, the, the Going back to unity of mind, body, and spirit, because uh, Sigmund the cat and the racing driver when he's racing, it, they, the, the, these labeling it mind, labeling, labeling the other bit body and the other bit spirit, these are man-made labels. When it all works as one, you can label it whatever piece, whatever bits you want. You can call it man, a mind, body, spirit, and and libido, or mind, body, spirit, and toenails. You can label it what you want. Um, but we have a bit that can self-observe. We can self-observe what our body's doing. We can, we usually do, we can self-observe what our thinking is doing. We can observe what our awareness is doing. We can observe our creativity. We can observe our humor. We can even observe our spontaneity. And in my experience, as soon as we're self-observing any of those bits, they work less well. Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, other people will know more about this than me. I think that's, that's Heisenberg, isn't it? That's um, the act of observing something stops it from doing what it was doing. Mm. So I wanted to get them out of the way, get them out of the way of self-observation, get them out into that so that they're in this zone of, um, uh, of um, responding to the outside world mm. in, uh, in, in, in one piece. Mm. Mm. I, 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 um, I could do a caricature of a certain kind of Alexander teacher, um, which is, uh, well, this is about posture, isn't it? Or it's about release of muscle tension. I actually don't want to have a free body. I don't want to have a free body. Why wouldn't you want to have a free body? No, I don't want a free body. I'll just do a caricature of a certain kind of freeing your body. Okay, my neck's free. My shoulders are free. Okay, my arms are free. Yep, my lower back is free and my hips are free. Can you see what I've withdrawn from? Mm. I'm just, hang on, just go and check. My knees are free. Okay, so I've now got a free body, but I've lost something else. Mm. I don't want a free body. Well, what I want a free body for? I don't want a free body. I want freedom too. Mm. And as soon as I have freedom too, everything is freed up. Did you feel that when I did that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I, I don't want to free, I want freedom too. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a talk on mindfulness in a government department where I used to work before lockdown. And as I was leaving, they were starting a discussion about how difficult it is to clear your mind. Mm -hmm. Sadly, they didn't invite me to join in uh -huh. because um, what's, that, what's so difficult about clearing your mind? Uh -huh. It is so simple. I can't. I can't say it without swearing. It is uh, clearing your mind. It's so fucking simple. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, have you have you not heard? Have you heard me say this? No, no, no. I don't think so. Oh, uh, okay. Do you have trouble clearing your mind? Uh, I did for a while, but no longer. No. Oh, cool. Then I'll do mine, and then you can do yours. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, actually, I didn't tell the truth. I don't. Why would anyone want to clear their mind? Let's have a go. Notice the texture of the chair, the texture of the floor, the chair and the floor, and the sounds. The chair, the floor, the sounds, me and your peripheral vision. The floor, the chair, the sounds, me, your peripheral vision, the space behind. Keep choosing all that. Oh, the temperature. like this i have so much information about that going into my mind there isn't room for words or regrets or plans or and this isn't a clear mind this is what when people say a clear mind they want to get rid of the thinking they want to get rid of the but listen like this my mind is full mind full my mind full my mind is full of what's outside me. So this clear mind, I want a free body too, I want it free too, 
but free to what? Free to something out there that I can choose on the basis of. Now, if I do a, a, an exaggeration of the opposite of this, which is, right, okay, so there's the window. Now I'm looking at the world uh, through a glass darkly. I'm looking through it, at it through, it's the, the thinking equivalent or the awareness equivalent of going, oh, hang on, I better break because there's a red light. Oh, yes, my balcony is there. Oh, and I heard some swifts. I must remember to, that I'm interacting with the world through a layer of thinking and words and. I'm constructing, and I know the physics, I know that what my brain tells me, even when I'm sharply present, is not what. But if I do that, I'm creating constructs of the world and interpreting it through. So now my responses to the world are based on fantasy rather than, oh, there's the reality as much as I can make it. And you see what happens? I've come back to unity and I've become light and free and normal. Mm -hmm. Shall I keep going? Because I've got one more thing to say about this. Go for it, please. And that um, is, when we want to free our bodies, and so I'm going to free up, our bodies will only free up into space that we're aware of. Mm. If our consciousness is only a meter around us, our bodies won't free up as much as if our consciousness is out into the space. I can see 300 meters from here into that bigger space. Hmm. As soon as we go internal to get things to free up, we're, we're not going to free up. Hmm. So, your turn. Hmm. Uh, go, going back to this point about like having your hand near someone um it seemed like you're you're you said you're getting feedback on what's happening for them and then also there's a kind of resonance that happens and that seems like a theme as well that just just being around someone that has these qualities is like we pick it up and how do you make sense of that what's happening there uh both both that well, yeah like the two directional feedback that people are picking up on that you're picking up on that they're picking up on I'm not sure I do make sense of it. Mm. Um, I didn't finish The Power of Now, mm. uh, but I believe he says somewhere, either in that or elsewhere, that the best way to learn to be in the here and now is to sit next to someone else who is in the here and now. And um, that's what we're doing. Mm. But at some point, I want to talk about how this is about, about being in the now. Um, how does it work? Why does it work? I don't know. It's spooky. I'm a scientist. I don't believe in anything I can't measure. But I can feel when someone behind me, an Alexander teacher behind me, has diminished their aliveness. I can feel it. Mm. I don't know how it works. And I don't think it's magic. I think it's magical, as in it's like magic. But I think at some point we, we'll be able to measure it. I heard. Uh, the professor of circadian rhythms on the radio recently. And he said he was at, a, he was delivering a lecture. And I think I've got the details right. I've got the spirit of it right. And he said in this lecture, there must, two other scientists, there must be some other receptor other than rods and cones in our eyes mm. that recognize light and dark that are wired to some other part of the brain. Now, I paraphrased that. That was my understanding of it. And someone at the back stood up and said, bullshit, and uh -huh. walked out. And 10 years later, it was shown that he was right. Huh. Now, we don't need to know how things work. If we don't know how now, we will probably find out how. But I think it's, it's something to do with group communication, you know, dogs. One of the reasons I use cats as examples in my work and not dogs is that we can train dogs. Dogs will get to look like their owners. Cats don't get to look like their owners. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, a, we sort of get to fit in with our group. I think it's one of the things that's made us so adaptable to spread around the world that we can change how we, how we do things. And I think we need to, we need to fit in with our group for I, I do a lot of people watching and I used to live I wrote about this I, I used to live near the Shard which is Europe's tallest building when it was new tourists would come to look at it and they'd look up at the top I'm going to have to do it over that way because otherwise my eyes were 
I'm going to have a look at the building I can see 300 meters away. <laughs> so a group of tourists will come and look at the building like that. If you want to look at the building, you just have to point your eyes at it. But I think three people doing it like that aren't having a shared experience. If you all do it like that, you're having a shared experience. Huh. Huh. So I think we develop what other people are doing around. Well, here's another example. Someone I was teaching who was 87 said she was in the kitchen with a tray and she observed herself shuffling around like that to put it down. And she said, she's doing some Alexander. She said, that's how old people move. I'm not going to do that anymore. And she turns at her waist and put it down. Now, the interesting thing about that was that she could turn at her waist, but she didn't. Why not? Because if you're the only 87-year-old who moves like that, when everyone else is going, you're not part of their gang. Mm. If you're the only 14-year-old who's up here when everyone else is, you're not part of their gang. So we adopt other people's, and I think it's probably built into us to do that. Mm. That if everybody's like this, you join in with this. And the other thing is, of course, oh, this is about how, how it works to get it back. I don't know, but it's along those lines, the, the sort of resonating off each other. But these complicated things we do, we partly do them because school teachers expect us to. This is what thinking looks like. This is what teachers want us to do. This is what looking looks like. But this is what we're expected to do. Concentrating, trying. Are you listening to me? Yes. Well, you don't look like you're listening. Mm. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Yes. Well, you don't look like you're ready. Ah, oh, okay. <sighs> so we develop these things to show other people. Or that's partly I'm pointing at the television over there. Mm. It's partly films and television that do it. I watched something where there was police officer or whatever, there was a plot to kill him. How did we know? Well, his assistant was onto it. How could we tell his assistant was onto it? Police officer was there, the gang were over there, and the assistant was going. So now we know that she's onto them. So then we think that that's, that's what we see on the television. That's what we think we have to do when we're thinking about something complicated. This is what thinking looks like. Do you remember what my catchphrase is? Oh, we're all bonkers. We're all bonkers, yeah. <laughs> we, humanity, are bonkers. Can you so, explain that for the people listening? Well, what? That we're all bonkers? Yeah, why, why we're all bonkers. Oh, where shall I start? <laughs> we, uh, the things, uh, we, where we go wrong so easily, and then we, we, we think that's, we think it's, I mean, you just have to look at humanity right now to see how crazy, crazy we all are. Hmm. I, um, I, 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 currently don't have a lot of hope for mankind mm -hmm. um I, I won't be around well i don't know unless here we are doing this in may 2022 and um, when uh russia invaded ukraine i packed a grab bag so that you know if someone when russia invaded ukraine someone on social media said that they hoped that he would end up in a bunker mm. with a revolver like Hitler. The difference is Hitler didn't have a big red button <laughs> um, that would set off nuclear weapons. And if he did, he probably would have fired it. Mm. And um, so I packed a grab bag so I can drive off to Wales in my camper van. We, we are so, we humans are so stupid. The things we do for ego or beliefs about the past or my group is better than yours or your group treated my group badly 500 years ago and therefore you know why don't we just talk to each other mm. Mm. bonkers mm. so now look we've gone serious go and go and have a look around again turn your head turn your head and then you break the spell right then you yes. breathe again mm. so so there's another thing I saw you do this weekend that is related to this hand thing. You're using your hand for it, but I uh, want to talk about it in more detail. You offered to give Michael Ashcroft, who's been on the show, Michael, multiple times, uh, an espresso shot. 
What is what were you talking about there? You weren't literally oh, okay. talking about an espresso okay. shot. It's a so metaphor. That's the only time you you saw me do an espresso shot. Okay, Michael wasn't the only one. Oh well, then you then you did a, a very impressive thing after that. But that was that was when you explicitly used the term. So what 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 is that, and what are you doing there? Well, I as um I'm I'm intrigued to know what the very impressive thing is. But I'll tell you about the espresso shot first. I um. Someone told me how to get upgraded when you fly. Now, this doesn't work anymore because um, the British Airways, for instance, they want it all done beforehand electronically. But in the days when you got, went up to the desk and got a seat, I was told this too late. She was told it by a famous actor, and um, it worked, apparently. You go up to the desk with your stuff and you say something like, oh, you must be really busy and it's all stressful and blah, 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 blah. And then you do this and you bring them up with you. Mm. And then they upgrade you. Mm. Apparently it worked for the actor and her friend. And So we can do that when people come in for the training or for a one-to-one -one lesson. I can come down here with them and then, or I can stay up here while they, and give them time to. But I like to start their day with a big hit of freedom and aliveness and movability and. So, so we've already established that we resonate. If I do this, you're breathing less. Oh, go and have your breathing back. <laughs> So I put my hands on like this and diminish my own space and my own freedom. And then I give myself my own space and my own freedom. And they tend to go. And it's sort of, it's like a, a it's, it's like an espresso. It's like a wake up into Alexander. And that's a good way to, that's a good way to start the day. Mm. Or as Michael arrived in the afternoon, that was a good way to start the afternoon. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh... But I'm intrigued to know what was impressive. Oh, you had the so so uh, the context of this workshop is is it's it's also a teacher training workshop. So we'll talk about that more. But uh, there's there's you know random people like riff raff like myself coming in, and then there's <laughs> you know the trainees, and uh, you got several of the trainees in a row. It was Michael and then Luli, who's also been on the show, and then another gentleman, oh, yeah, and you yeah. had them like everyone had their hand on each other's back, and you sort of passed uh the baton in milliseconds between all of them and then they were all all moving together in a certain way uh, yeah yeah i had my hand on michael's back michael had his hand on luli's back mm -hmm. luli had her hand on andy's back mm -hmm. now because of the way eyes work we were and i deliberately got myself so that andy couldn't see me so mm -hmm. he wasn't responding to me mm -hmm. and i made that choice and Michael freed up, and as a consequence, Lily freed up, and as a consequence, Andy freed up. And you could up. see it. I mean, it was like dominoes, basically, and in milliseconds. So, yeah, that was cool. Spooky, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, hmm. I don't know how it works, but it works. Uh -huh. And um, and um, I saw uh, Professor John Dewey, who I've only heard of in an Alexander context. I think Americans have heard of him for other reasons. He came up with the Dewey Decimal Librarian Catalog thing. He was described as um, father of the American educational system. He described Alexander's discovery and how he taught it, because Dewey went for lessons with him for a long time, as scientific. And one of the ways in which it is scientific is if we bring about the same results, bring about the same conditions, we get the same results over and over and over again. Um, a homeopath told me it's good being a homeopath because sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. So you give people a remedy and when they come back the following week you, and you ask, how are you? If they say I've got better, you can say good. And if they say I've got worse, you can say good. Uh, I, I, I think the Alexander thing is scientific in that it is consistent to bring about the same conditions, you get the same result. Now, I don't know how it works, mm -hmm. but I do know that it does work, and it works again and again and again. Oh, and another thing, um, so one of the first people I ever taught came to back in 1993, came to me because she had 
arthritis. There are two types of arthritis. It was the kind in her knees where the cartilage had worn away and her bones were rubbing against each other. Um, we think of bone as inert, mm. but I can tell you having had phone for bone marrow biopsies, mm. bone is alive and full of nerves that her, she was in pain because her bones were rubbing together. So Alexander won't get rid of the pain and show her to move in a lighter way so she creates less of it and to give it less focus. Mm. Please note, I'm not saying to pretend the pain isn't there. There's the pain and there's everything else. But she came in very happy one day. She said that uh, a nutritionist had put her on a diet which included, this is a long time ago, so I can't remember the details, except that she wasn't to eat potatoes. And after a month, the toxins will have gone and she won't be in pain. Mm. I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. not convinced about this, but I'm not going to say so. A month later, she came back for another lesson with me and she was in tears. Mm -hmm. The um, nutritionist have said, this, isn't, this diet isn't working, we'll have to put you on another one. Uh, one of the great things about Alexander is that people pick up on what it's about within five minutes mm. and can almost instantly decide whether it's worth pursuing, whether it's going to help them, whether they want to learn it. Well, that's another example of us being bonkers. Um, I'm doing a Terry Pratchett. I can't remember what the question was. But I'm just going to, if that's all right, stop mm. me if I'm... I've taught people who come in with physical discomfort discover that they can be physically more comfortable but don't want to learn it because they're going to have to step out of their mental comfort zone mm -hmm. yes it's lighter and easier and i'm in less pain but how am i going to learn this uh -huh. Uh -huh. he didn't come back um what's another one a psychotherapist who said she put her head on one side like this and said yes it's lighter and easier but i need to go away and think about how it fits in with what i already believe uh -huh. Never saw her again. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. But people would rather stay in their comfort zone. Oh, a dentist I used to teach, mm. uh, also back in the early 90s, who said that um, every morning at 8.30, he had to brace himself for other people's pain and fear. Mm. So he had a lesson. He said that at the end, he said he was standing pain-free for the first time in years. Got out of his wallet handed me notes, what shall I do to work at it? Uh -huh. I said, well, I want you to not work at it. You've been working at things all your life. And I gave him some non-working at it homework. Came back the following week, pain-free again for the second time. What shall I do to work at it? As he handed me a bundle of notes. Huh. Booked another lesson and then phoned and cancelled it with the receptionist because he said he was too old to change. Mm. So he would rather be in pain than change how he went about doing things. A friend of mine who's an osteopath says she doesn't like Alexander because you have to think about it. Mm. Now, what does that mean? I mean, osteopaths are good. You get pain, you go and get clicked. You do this and get neck pain, you go and get clicked. Come back to your desk, you do this and you get neck pain, you go and get clicked. You come back and do this. Someone told me he'd got a really good osteopath and he'd going to have 16 years. Unless you go, oh, look what I'm doing. Look what, I'm, oh, look, I can do it like that. Feels weird, but it's more comfortable. And then five minutes later, my neck pain starting. What am I doing? I'm doing that again. Let's come back to this. You have to think about it. Some people don't want to think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're bonkers. Mm -hmm. We all say we want to change, and most of us don't want to change. Let's come back to this. Come back to the space. And the sounds. Turn your head, mate. Turn your head. Now, there you've changed it, all right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. There's something you said um, at the end of, you know, my, most people, including myself, that were at this session were asking you a question of, uh, how do I work at this, as you said, with the dentist? Um, and you said, I forget exactly how you put it, but something like the body knows and the body will learn how to do this. Uh, okay. What, what did you mean by that? And uh, how, how do you know that? Yeah. What, what in your experience has led you to say that? 
Okay, I think they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. I'm pouring my tea. So you, you, your body knows what to do. As long as we have unity, your body knows how to get you out of the chair. It knows how to walk over there. It knows how to pick up your, your team. And that's, that's different from how will I learn it? What should I do as homework? Mm. And I, as homework, I tend to give notice how you do things. Notice how, um, there was a person I was teaching today. We were playing with the idea of being in charge. You're, you're in charge here because you're the interviewer. This is your gig and you're asking me questions. It would be very easy. Have you ever done partner dancing like tango? Or... A little bit, uh, yeah. I've done tango and I'm usually a leader, but occasionally I follow. And the worst kind of follower, or the best kind of follower is completely in charge of themselves, usually herself, completely in charge of herself. And just for now gives permission for me to decide where we're going. The worst kind goes, oh, you're in charge. So, and then they go floppy. And mm -hmm. um, that just because someone else is in charge doesn't mean you hand, have to hand over power. Mm. Um, so you're in charge and I'm not handing over power. But a lot of people come for a lesson and they go, okay, you're the only example teacher. So you tell me what to do. And now she have handed power to you. Mm. <laughs> So we were playing with who who was in who was in charge. Staying, I was telling him to stay in charge of himself. I'm really good at staying in charge of myself. The one time I can remember losing it is going at Baltimore Airport, going through the metal detector thing, and it going beep beep beep, and this angry policeman with a gun patting me down and pulling my Oyster card out of my pocket. For those of you who don't know, Oyster card looks like a credit card and it's to get you on London buses and London Underground and that kind of thing. He said, I told you to take everything out of your pockets. Mm. And I handed over power. Mm. He's got a gun and I want to show him, I'm not going to argue with him. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I thought you meant everything metal. You see what I've done? Uh, I have to make sure you power. Uh. Yes. I'm sorry, I thought you meant everything metal. And he gave it back to me and I went over and I got my belt and I got my shoes and I put all my metal things back in my pocket. But I got my power back. Mm. So the person I was teaching today thought this was really interesting. And I didn't say your homework is to be powerful or stay or be in charge of yourself. Your homework is to notice when you're not. Mm. Your homework is to notice when you hand over power or to notice when you've got an urge to hand over power. So the homework I t t give tends to be notice when you, notice when you're organizing your body, mm. notice when you're scurrying, notice when you're, just get familiar with your habits. Mm. But your body does know, your body knows how to do it. Your body knows how to be upright. Mm. And non-Alexander people have two choices about everything. I frequently say to people, I teach the Alexander technique and they say, oh, good posture. I say, well, it isn't really about posture, and you don't need to hold yourself up. Oh, okay. And then they slump. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it's not about slumping. Oh, okay. Because they don't realize there's a way of being completely effortlessly upright. Like this, they know how they're doing it. Like this, they know that they're not doing the thing they know how to do. My body knows how to do this. And interestingly, these, these middle, these um, um, binary choices about things. What's another one? Oh, busy, 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 and relaxing. Stressed and doing mindfulness, that kind of thing. That those are the choices people think they have. And I, I people come to me with, um, they, they say, um, I, I do, or I meet people, I do Pilates for my body and mindfulness for my mind. Mm, well, that's interesting. Mind and body are demonstrably one. Your body knows how to do it. Your thinking systems know how to think. Your eyes know how to look. Oh, hang on. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yep. My system knows how to look. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um... What does this having control over yourself and this aliveness, how do, how do those things fit into the picture? Well, it'd be really weird if we didn't have control over ourselves. Mm -hmm. Some people don't. Like, um, I wonder who's going to watch this. Well, I suppose the person I'm about to talk about, if they do start watching it, they won't get this far. Um, someone I know every year, her New Year's resolution is to lose weight. Mm. Every year for the 30 odd years that I've known her. That person's not in control of herself. Mm. I, I tell you something I've, I've written in my new book about um, Oprah Winfrey. There's an Oprah Winfrey show. I've never seen it. And she had a, there's a TV psychologist who started on her show, I believe, Dr. Phil, mm. Dr. Phil someone. Now I got this in a book by Zimbardo. I think it was a book about happiness that um, this is how I remember it. Dr. Phil got a phone call from Oprah Winfrey saying that um, she'd got some girlfriends staying and they all wanted his advice. So would he please go and join them? Yes, he would. And I think she sent a car that took him to a private plane that flew him to, and when he got there, they were all having dinner. And she said, "We, what we want to know is why are we all fat? Mm. And he said, well, because you want to be. Mm. He said that you, they all knew what choices to make about food and exercise to lose weight. Mm. They had known for years what choices to make about food and exercise to not gain weight and that they hadn't and weren't making those choices. Mm. Now, anyone who isn't making the choices that they know they need to make, they're not in charge of their lives. If you're putting on weight when you don't want to, and you know how to not put on weight, and you're not making those choices, you're not in charge of your life. Mm. Are you looking doubtful? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, more just chewing, I mean, I mean like, um... It's it's like, um, okay, so Alexander Technique isn't just about posture or physical benefits, although, you know, those things come. It's about uh, mind, body, spirit, unity, and, um, you know, uh, like space and awareness and things like this. And then um, how I'm, the, the question I'm sort of chewing is like, it, from that description, it's it's not obvious to me that, like, having control over yourself or aliveness or okay. fit into that. And I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots here. So not doubt. But... I suppose one, one of the things I haven't been clear about mm. is what, what the ideal outcome of learning the Alexander Technique is, unity of mind, body, and spirit, how we teach people to get that, and then what benefits they can get from it. And one of the, when we're fully conscious, I'm teaching people to be fully conscious, we become aware of what we're doing and we can make choices about, I'm teaching people that they can make choices about things they didn't know they had choices about. If someone with back pain only knew that one and that one, then I'm showing them that they can make a choice that they didn't know they had a choice about. Mm. Oh, hang on. I just, I'm acting. I was going to say my phone's going, but I turned it off and put it away. Oh, hang on. My tablet's buzzing. I'm just going to, and if I do that every time, and the Alexander teacher says, well, look, you can look at your tablet like that. <laughs> You're discovering, I mean, which would we rather look like? We're discovering we have choices about things we didn't know we had choices about. That frequently there's a stimulus and we respond the way we always respond. And Alexander teaches us to go, when we're fully conscious, uh, we can go, oh, hang on. Yeah, actually I'll do it this way. What's a good example? 
oh i'm 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 on uh, some fairly heavy medication i'm on steroids i was on a dose of steroids 20 times as big as this a year ago mm. one of the side effects of steroids is hunger mm. if i'm on autopilot i go oh hungry eat some chocolate biscuits i put on weight with alexander we go i'm hungry I Yeah, I'll have one. Or hunger, I'm going to... No, no, it's too close to lunch. I'll have my lunch early and then I can have a chocolate biscuit later if I want. To catch ourselves doing the habit or about to do the habit and to make a new choice when we're fully conscious. It's very difficult to do your habits when you're fully conscious. Mm. I wonder if that's true. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to bite your nails when you're fully conscious. This makes sense? Mm -hmm. So we have this of, thing. Go on. So you're sort of pausing, and in the pause, there's space for a new choice. That's Making a decision whether you're going to, rather mm -hmm. than doing it on auto autopilot. We have this word that Alexander used before Freud, which is inhibition. Mm -hmm. It's that thing cats do when they see a mouse. They don't go, oh, mouse. Bro. They go, mouse. No, not yet, not yet, not yet. Choosing to put off the thing that they've got an urge to do. Um, so for me, um, ways in which I've used it are, well, not running away from the hospital while I was waiting for my second biopsy, mm. um, really wanting to go, really wanting to go, but choosing to not respond to that urge to go or, uh, deciding not choosing not to have a beer. That's a choice. Mm. Knowing there's a beer in the fridge and having an urge all evening to go and get that beer and keep choosing, that's what we call inhibition. Mosquito bite on my hand and knowing that if I scratch it, it'll swell up and it's itching and it's itching, choosing all day not to, that's what we call inhibition. What's happening in uh, that moment? What, what is the subjective experience of, that makes that possible? Subjective experience. Yeah. Well, I've, I've learned to, um, if I stay conscious, I can, if as soon as I daydream, I'm gonna do that. But if I stay conscious, and I'm really good now at staying conscious, I can keep choosing not to keep choosing not to do it. So about losing weight. Oh, and the other thing is, if this feels this feels familiar because this is what I always do, this is going to stay, this is going to feel weird. Mm -hmm. So something I've just written in my new book is that we know how to embrace the unfamiliar. Mm. That to make to make a change. We have to do things that don't feel right, that don't feel like what we normally do. So if we're going to lose weight, for instance, if you always, I like to end my lunch with something sweet, it's usually two chocolates, uh, digestive biscuits. Mm. Now, if I decide not to do that because I want to lose weight, to not have them will feel unfamiliar. I will feel un it'll feel unresolved. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If every time I go to the cinema, I get a big box of popcorn and a big fizzy drink, and I sit there doing this, if I decide not to, to lose weight, I'll go to the cinema and I go, oh, hang on. Uh, uh, it'll feel unfamiliar. We like to feel familiar. We don't like new feelings. Adults don't like new feelings. Mm -hmm. When my son was four or five he got a fish bone stuck in his throat mm. and um, so have some dry bread. No, 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 no. Have, have some Coca-Cola. No, 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 no. He wouldn't do anything to. So after a while he stopped complaining about it. And that evening at about seven o'clock, he went, Oh, the fish bone's just gone. And he had spent the whole day, the whole afternoon carrying on as normal, even though we wouldn't do that. We'd go, I've got a fish bone in my throat. Oh, what am I going to do? It might be here forever. Which later, all that. We don't like new we don't like we don't like new feelings mm. so we like to do things the same way every time alexander teaches us to hang on oh make it feels wrong but i can i can see that it's constructive mm. so making new choices so for the people that do work with you um you know and they're sort of willing to change uh unlike you know the dentist or the what what have you uh what kinds of changes do you send to see in people? What does the manifestation of this unity look like practically? I'm going to say something else first. And if I don't come back to that, do remind me. 
I'm quite good at sneaking change past people. Mm. Mm. I don't impose it on them. Mm. Um, someone I used to teach 20 something years ago, when I invite people into this and then I ask them, how are you different? Mm. Right? Mm. Or various, or what is your experience of self right now? And um, I used to ask this woman, how are you different? And she would say, well, I know what you mean, but I'm not different. Mm. So we agreed. I would never, we would never talk about Alexander in the lessons. Huh. So she'd come and we'd have a chat about sailing or what our children are up to and that kind of thing. And then off she'd go. I said, Why is she coming? She obviously likes me. She enjoys having a chat. And, but she's not learning anything. And then one day she said, this Alexander, so one day she said, I've noticed on a crowded train, I don't have to hold any, on anymore, I just balance. Mm. And then one day she said, I used to enjoy arguing with a colleague and sulking for an hour afterwards, but now I can't enjoy it because I know I can choose not to do it. Mm. Mm. So we had, the change had gone the change had gone in from the other side without her. You know, when I sneak change past people, I don't have an agenda. Mm. I'm sneaking more of this thing that they were had when they were toddlers past them. So what was the question? What, what kinds of changes do you tend to see in people? What, what does this unity actually look like when it takes? Well, the, the, um, pe people tend to notice the physical differences first and that's that's fair enough because they usually come for physical um problems they, they a lot of people come with back pain and uh sometimes because we don't actually address the pain i've heard several times people say well my back pain just went and i didn't notice mm. that um, someone told me uh, early on in my alexander career someone told me that he started having Alexander lessons with someone else for his back pain. And they kept wondering, what am I supposed to do? What is this Alexander thing? What am I, what's it about? And when one of his friends asked him, why are you no longer grumbling about your back pain? Mm. And he realized it had just gone. And then he came back for Alexander. He said it, originally it was for his back pain, but now it was just for him, the physical things. And then people see their, their granny for the first time in a year and the granny says oh you look different you look taller and you look brighter and so those those are obvious visual changes someone told me that um she'd realized she has got the courage to speak up in uh in team meetings um people's relationships change, their level of happiness changes, their shape changes. Um, uh, I used something, I don't, I wonder if I'm gonna say this. I think when I was married when I started training and I think the training was the beginning of the end of the marriage, yeah. that two somewhat complicated people got together and I gradually uncomplicated with Alexander. And um, so, yeah, lots of relationships and friendships change and priorities change. And uh, But happiness is a big thing. Mm -hmm. People tend to be happier. That makes sense, yes. So you do lessons for people and you teach the Alexander Technique, but you also train teachers in the Alexander Technique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me about that. What is what is the training with you involve? And uh, I get the sense as well from talking to Michael about this that the, the way you do it is maybe different than other trainings. So can you speak to that as well? I think where where I trained, I, I'm uh, I, I I like to think of myself as on the extreme anarcho liberal left wing of the. <laughs> Um, and where I trained was somewhat anarcho-liberal. Mm. But I didn't know what exactly I was training in when I trained. Mm. And I make it absolutely clear to the people that I'm training what it is I'm training them to do. I think that, uh, but then the majority of the the training that, okay, the, the ones that I visited, 
and I have around the world visited more schools than the 98% of Alexander teachers. We're teaching unity and we're teaching how to make new choices about things. And there are some places where they are teaching unity, but not teaching how to make choices. Mm. And there are other places where they teach choices, but aren't teaching unity. So one approach to teaching is, okay, if you're going to go over to that window, what do you have to do? Well, I will shift and have to shift my weight. And then I have to, and then they'll say, well, what if you do the shifting your weight in this easier way? What if you go up to there in this different way? What if, cool. It's a lighter and easier way of doing it. And you're making new choices about how you move, but you will not learn unity that way. And then there are people who will get you vertically in and out of a chair and do some horizontal stuff. And there's frequently very little dialogue. I had a lesson like that. Um, the last time I had a lesson like that, I walked home from it with my legs feeling funny that they had changed. They were unfamiliar, as we were saying before. Something had changed in my coordination, but I had not learned anything. Hmm. That approach to teaching is, in my opinion, a, a kind of conditioning. You're taught, can I just say, I forgot to say at the beginning of this, Almost Alexander is good. Hmm. Almost all Alexander is good. Just some of it is, in my experience, gooder than others. <laughs> but you, you you say the words to yourself, neck free, head forward and up, back lengthen and wide. And while the teacher gives you the experiences, and then when you go home, you go, oh, yeah, neck free, head forward and up, back lengthen and wide. And, and your system associates what the teacher gave you with... Um, those words and the change happens. It doesn't teach you to make choices. Um, F.M. Alexander, when he discovered it, he was he was an actor who had um, respiratory respiratory and vocal problems, and he spent a long time experimenting with what was causing the problems. And it turned out to be, firstly, that when he was about to recite, he gasped in air and. <sighs> tightened his neck and pulled his head back on and down, and that's what was squashing, squashing his vocal cords. Mm. But then he found he couldn't stop himself from doing that. It was such a habit that to stop himself from doing it, if he stopped himself from doing it, he became wooden and he couldn't act. And as soon as he became natural again, this thing just happened. What he discovered was that he was doing it when he was getting ready to recite. And he couldn't stop himself from getting ready. So he stayed able to do something else instead. As long as he was able to do anything, it didn't happen. So he was teaching himself that he had choices about things. So choices, unity. I wonder whether my school, I haven't visited enough to know, I wonder if my school is unique in teaching unity and choices. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder. And what does the training with you involve? What is uh, becoming certified to be a teacher with you involve? Well, lots of fun and then going to the pub afterwards. Oh, that's right. Um, <laughs> you want to know the, the structure? It's also, as far as I know, it's, um, it's one of two part-time schools in the UK. I did train with the mainstream professional body, but they've got this bonkers system where it's their, their, their courses have to be full-time mm. and they can't include weekends they have to be on weekdays mm. um, so when I set up a part-time school I resigned from the professional body I've got on my to-do list to grumble to the professional body that mm. I've noticed that someone else who's a member and has been for many many years is openly training Alexander teachers outside the system so in that case they should allow me back in mm. um, that is part-time we do one weekend a month and some stuff on Zoom. And I encourage people to go and do Alexander with other people. Um, it is, I think mine is unique in that it is qualitative rather than quantitative. Mm. For the mainstream professional body, if you do 1,600 hours at a, an approved training course, you'll get a certificate. Mm -hmm. And mine is, you get a certificate when you're, when you're ready to teach. Well, I think the first of my teachers only did 800 and something hours. She did a lot of Alexandra elsewhere. 
other people have done more than more than 1600 hours um but it's you know people learn it at their learn it at their own speed the idea of fitting it into 1600 hours for everyone is um or making some people stay for 1600 hours when they probably could qualified six months before is strange and also 1600 hours came from one of the early training courses they made it 1600 hours to fit in with home office regulations mm -hmm. to get some kind of so that um so that overseas students could get a visa to come and train it had to be um home office approval only worked for courses that are over 1600 hours so that's where the figure came from Mm -hmm. um, and it's become a shibboleth. I'm not sure what that word means. In fact, I can barely pronounce it, but uh -huh. it's become <laughs> accepted that that's what you have to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people to I'm teaching people to think for themselves. Mm. Um, the the you come for a lesson. You came to the group. Mm -hmm. We played catch. Mm -hmm. You had to get out of the way of organising yourself the way you normally do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and it's hard it's it's initially with a ball it, it's not easy to do that put your hands on someone else and it's even more complicated mm. it's all the stuff about uh, mm. oh no uh, so it's don't tell any of my trainees or anyone else but it's exactly the same thing mm. learning to train it training to teach it is just the same as learning it for yourself it's just this person is the bigger stimulus than a ball is. Mm. What does being ready constitute? Like, how do you know when someone's ready when you certify them? Mm. Oh, that's simple. It's like, how do you know when you're in love? Mm. It happened with um, one of the teachers who graduated with me, the wonderful Claire Nichols. I said to her one of the weekends, I think I'm going to sign for you next week. No, you're ready to teach. Uh -huh. You're absolutely ready to teach. It's like realizing I was in love with lovely Julia. It wasn't that I wasn't in love with her half an hour before. I just hadn't. Oh, it's that. It's absolutely clear when people are ready to teach. Hmm. Well, what is it that you notice that's clear? Uh... Oh, that thing I said earlier about um, I'm having to put work into diminishing my freedom and aliveness and when i let go of the work i come back to that mm -hmm. and that um, when people start the training they're in here and they have to learn to do that mm. that and then when they put stop putting effort into it they go back to that it probably turns around about the point where i sign the certificate mm -hmm. the other thing is that whatever this is that you pick up on if i switch it off again well, bang, I'm going to have it back. That I, I'll show you how much Alexander I wake up with. Hang on, we just right. This is how much Alexander I wake up with. How much unity and aliveness and and awareness of what's around me. Now I can turn the volume up. I come back and I can turn the volume down. Hmm. And people are ready to teach when they walk in on the Friday night or on the Saturday morning with enough of it that they can put their hands on people and not have to change anything and that person will respond. Mm -hmm. If they have to go, right, i put my hands on, right, now I'll do my Alexander, then they're not ready to teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't tell Luli. Uh -huh. No, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> she knows perfectly well. <laughs> yes. Uh what what are you doing there subjectively to turn the volume one way or the other? Hmm. Tricky to say. Yeah. Well, let's have a go. I, I know how to switch it off. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing when I switch it off. Let me try it. I, I sh when I first discovered this, I showed it to my friend uh, Galit mm. in, in Tel Aviv. Hang on. I switched it off like this. And then I switched it on like this, bang. She said, oh, that's really good. But bang is not a good word to use in Israel. <laughs> you know, she, what I do when I switch it off, can I switch it off and say, uh, 
okay, this thing is what small children have. Mm. And then when we start to slump and all that kind of thing, we switch it off. Oh, dad, you're so embarrassing. That kind of, oh, can't be bothered. That. And then, and I don't think I was ever this bad. I can get that back like that. Now I've got back what I had when I was a small child, I think. And um, small children like me. Mm. I think sometimes they think I'm, and now I'm going to do that again. Yeah, I'm accessing the slumpy thing when I, has, I had when I was a teenager. It involves switching off the mechanisms that will keep my body lightly upright. And in doing so, it's dampened down. Well, listen to the way I'm talking. It's dampened down. And when I do that, I'm switching on the mind, body, mm -hmm. something. I suppose if I give you the secret and uh, you can do it, then uh, maybe I should keep it to myself. And how, what do I do when I turn the volume up? It's something I don't work with energy. Let me just try it. Oh, that. It's mm -hmm. something about getting more awareness of what's outside me. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I'll just get it back to what I wake up with. Because in um, when I'm teaching one-to-one, -one, when I'm with my trainees, I'm in this zone most of the time. But some people come for one-to-one -one with me, and if I turn it up beyond there, they, they're going to explode hmm. or run away, that it's too, it's too scary. Hmm. It's too much to cope with. Hmm. Oh, that. But I, I do that with my trainees. Hmm. Hmm. Why would it be the case that it would be too scary to cope with? I think, well, having been painfully shy, I had an experience that the, when I started training, one of the teachers who was a very confident, um, loud person, um, we were both playing drums and he was keeping eye contact and he was clearly inviting me, looking back, clearly inviting me. And I was, because I couldn't look people in the eye, I was looking at him here and it was, I didn't want all that eye contact. I didn't want to be opened up. I didn't want, I wanted to put all my barriers up. Mm -hmm. And if he, to keep myself safe. And if he had done less of it, I probably would have been able to cross over what, to what he was doing more. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that if, if someone has come in in this sort of complicated state of, Oh, this state of mind-body complication. Uh, I can't even talk while I'm like this. <laughs> that to get them to this, it's it's they're not available to respond to this much of it. Mm. They're available to respond to this much of it. So we'll do that this this week, and then the next week we'll do that, and the next week, and we'll gradually invite um, invite them into a bigger space. I, I, I'd like to say at this point, I don't think all these things while I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Like the racing driver, I just do it. Mm -hmm. And like the racing driver doesn't go, mm, shall I go to the right of that car or shall I go to the left of that car? Mm, I think I'll wait until he just responds. Someone comes in, I don't think, oh, how shall I keep it? I just respond. I've done it for so long. Or like in Aikido. I think people don't go, um, mm, this person is attacking me. Now, how shall I? I think I've, they just respond. Mm -hmm. yes. So, same with tango. Mm -hmm. When I was training, um, we did an experiment. One of the trainees who was actually married to another trainee, we did this experiment where we, we put our barriers up and then we both did this at the same time. Mm -hmm. My stomach rumbling. That's interesting. Take the barriers away and my stomach rumbles. And then we did that. We're both doing it. And then we did this. She said, one more of those. We'll have to get married. Uh -huh. So I quickly put them all back. Uh -huh. again. <laughs> right, right. Huh. Oh, I think one of the reasons I, um, in my 50s, fell so fabulously in love with my wonderful, fabulous girlfriend was that uh, now I know how to have my heart open 
mm. in a way that I didn't when I was in my 30s. Mm. Mm. So put my, my barriers up. Now I'm safe. Now I'm British. That was a joke about being British. Yes, yes. So. You looked British. <laughs> Did I? That's interesting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yes. But I, I didn't, I deliberately didn't say that that very, um, very confident Alexander teacher who was looking me in the eye yeah. and he, he was American. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so I asked earlier about how you um, changed from doing Alexander Technique yourself, but I, I found myself curious as well how you've changed over the years from teaching it, if, you, if there are ways that you've needed to change or grow or new things you oh to learn. yeah yeah it changes all the time mm -hmm. i used to go to washington dc every six months to work with my colleague antoinette and every time i went she would tell me how my teaching had changed mm. and i hadn't noticed it had changed mm. Mm. new ways of getting it across just arise i find myself teaching differently I'm much clearer what it is I'm teaching, particularly as I've been, since I, I started training teachers, I've been teaching Alexander for 20, 28 years this year, I've been training Alexander teachers for eight years, and I've learned more in the eight years than I did in the whole of the previous 20. Mm -hmm. Working with other teachers who visit my school and watching how they do it and finding ways of getting it across to this person so that this person can. And then I'm... I, writing this book about F.M. Alexander's books and rereading them and then rereading them, uh, I get clearer about what he was teaching and find find ways. I don't, I don't, um, I don't, uh, you know, this isn't an intellectual thing. It's something that just arises. Um, Alan Watts, one of my trainees, handed me an Alan Watts book. He said it was become become who you are, and um, I very politely said, "Oh, thank you." I put it in the school library, mm -hmm. and in my head, I was thinking, "I'm oh, not another bloody Alan Watts. I'm going to have to <laughs> read." But I was polite. I turned it over, and it said on the back, "Real life exists only at this very moment." I thought, "Wow, I wish I'd thought of describing it that way." Real life exists that on, only exists at this very moment. That's it. But he. He inside it. I don't like words that he uses. He calls this concentrating. I call this concentrating, mm -hmm. and I call this simply being aware. Mm -hmm. And getting rid of what Susan Blackmore calls the little me inside who organizes things, the self-observing bit, bit that we frequently identify with. What's a way of calling that? Well, he calls it dying to oneself. Mm. Uh, too spiritual. I don't know. Uh, it's just too spiritual. But he says, I've, I've, I find that people who have truly died to themselves, so people who are good at getting out of the way of that thing, um, don't think they've done anything special in the process. Mm. They think of themselves as lazy and lucky. Oh, yes. That's me, lazy and <laughs> I think it's lucky, fortunate and privileged. It's not luck, you know. It's it's fortunate and privileged. I haven't done anything. I trained, the change started, and I have followed that path of change. And all this stuff has opened up. Happiness has opened up. Um, uh, uh, availability to. Uh, for real relationships has opened up the enjoyment of the here and now new ways of teaching it creativity all these things have opened up as a result of of, of learning this mm. i want to say something about that spirituality thing did that answer the question mm -hmm. about spirituality yes one of the things i object to about um toller I mean, I started, I started reading The Power of Now, and I thought, it's just, I, I can't bear all this spirituality stuff. Mm. That, that like, um, like the idea that people only have two choices, one of them is this, and one of them is this, there is this, oh, now I'm doing stuff, and being, oh, and now I'm being spiritual. That, that The Power of Now, 
he said he discovered how to be in the here and now and he sat on park benches in bliss for a couple of for two years i think i i I, I he wasn't doing it right Hmm. lottery winners after after six months return to the same level of happiness you know he wasn't doing it right and didn't he have things he wanted to achieve Hmm. didn't didn't he have even if it was didn't he have people he wanted to share this with or or people he wanted to help out their difficulties or, or or feed the world or something selfish about sitting for six months for, for 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 two years and this idea that this being in the here and now is spiritual mm. it isn't mm. i'm good at being no one lives in the here and now once they lose it you can get it back you can choose to be in the here and now i'm pretty good at being in the here and now there's nothing spiritual about it it sets him up as a guru mm. someone told me i'm going to, have to be really careful here Someone told me that their Alexander teacher says, when you put your hands on people, it's like touching the universe. It's infinite. It's in unfathomable. It's mysterious. It's so I said to them, well, when you put your hands on people, is it? And they said, no, hmm. it isn't for me either. Put my hands on. It just is. Hmm. That Alexander teacher who said that, is now a great guru. I put my hands on and I've, oh, I'm not getting the same as that person who says it's like the universe and therefore they're much, much better at it than I am. They're getting something spiritual from it that I'm not. Hmm. Hmm. So I object to that word spiritual. Toller is a spiritual teacher. He's teaching what I'm teaching and this is not spirituality. Hmm. I'm hearing two objections to the word spirituality. One is uh, that the thing that's being pointed to is ordinary and not special. And second, that you're concerned that it sets up uh, like guru dynamics or, or power manipulation type things. Is that, is yeah, that yeah. am I hearing yeah. you correctly? Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I started training teachers, one of them said, uh, it must be wonderful being one with everything. Uh-huh. I said, no, it's, it's just ordinary, it just is. Mm. And by the time she qualified, she said, yeah, you're right. It just is. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. wonderful. Yes. Huh. Um, I feel like that resolves a, 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 um, an implicit question I had because, you know, for, for myself, I've come from like a, a primarily a Buddhist background. It's, it's an oversimplification, but shall we say a Buddhist background for this context? And um, uh, yeah, it seems to me that the Alexander Technique stuff that I've been exposed to is sort of pointing in the same direction. It's been helpful for me in like expanding what's possible there for me. Um, so it seems to be in similar territory for me. And I was wondering how, how you thought of that. And uh, what I'm hearing is it is in the same territory. It just doesn't, uh, we're not making a big deal about it. And it's not, you shouldn't go uh, worship someone or, or make yourself less than someone for this. Oh, no one should worship any other human. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, no one should put another human on the pedestal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's probably true. Um, well, I, I mean, point. to put it more simply, that there, there are sort of unnecessary social trappings with spirituality. So it's same territory, but we don't need these unnecessary social trappings. But I, I think in that same Alan Watts book, Become Who You Are, I think it's in that one, he said, I'm, I'm leery of too much mm-hmm. then. I think this is identical to then. I, as for bringing the trappings from Japan. Mm-hmm. And because I, I realised that this is, um, it's, this is identical to what's in um, Zen and the Art of Archery, I decided to go and do some Zazen. Mm-hmm. And I think, why do I have to step in with my left foot and step out with my right foot? Mm. Why do I have to sit facing the wall? And after we've done the walking around like this, why do I have to sit with the other leg crossed? What if I don't want to? What is it about the ritual that does this? And I don't think it does. I don't think the teachers need to dress in Japanese clothes. I don't think we need to have a Japanese bowl and a gong. Whatever this is, we can just choose it, that. Whatever surroundings we're in. It's one of the things I like about Zen in particular as meditation. I'm just going to read you something. Remember, Susan Blackmore is an academic. 
Mm. Who is studying the nature of consciousness? Asking these questions both requires and encourages a calm mind. Minds tend not to be calm. They tend to rush about full of overlapping thoughts, pushed here and there by emotional responses, irritated by tunes that go round and round and generally flashing from one thing to another. It's not possible to tackle any question steadily and deeply with a mind in turmoil. How then can the mind be calmed? Meditation is the obvious answer. Learning to meditate means nothing more than learning to sit still and pay attention, staying relaxed and alert. Hello, that sounds familiar. Without getting tangled up in trains of thought, emotions, or inner conversations. Well, hello, that sounds familiar too. What I like about Zen, other than Zazen, is Zen archery, Zen flower arranging, Zen calligraphy, Zen landscape painting, Zen whatever it's called, where you hit each other with sticks. If you learn to meditate, sitting still with your eyes closed, how are you going to learn to translate that into everything else you do? Whereas if we learn it playing catch or firing an arrow, we know how to translate it into everything we do. Mm. And, and again, if we sit still to do that kind of thing, it suggests, right, busy, 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 busy. Oh, now I'm going to do the meditation and clear my mind. And whereas what we're doing here is something that we can get at any point. Mm. And we don't need any knowledge about Buddhism, we don't need any knowledge about whether there's an afterlife or whether we get reincarnated. That goes with Buddhism. It doesn't go with the, the Zen part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, we, we don't, we can form our own personal opinions about whether we should eat animals. That goes with the, and I, I have a lot of respect for Buddhists. I'm not saying no one should be a Buddhist. I'm saying that why does this need to be connected to religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Religion has taken over so many parts of our lives. Like, um, um, uh, I'm glad to see there's a rise in non-religious um, naming ceremonies, non-religious marriages, non-religious funerals, which I intend to have, um, that we've handed or have handed all that stuff in our lives over to religion and um, as a someone of no religion I, you know don't see any religious or spiritual imperative to all this stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes sense makes sense mm. good because it didn't quite to me so i'm glad it did to you <laughs> i knew what i meant but i don't think i got it across exactly how i wanted to but don't worry, no one watched two hours of this <laughs> so oh you'd be surprised no my friend you'd okay. be surprised yeah um yeah, I want to come back relatedly to you sort of hinted at this earlier, but um, you know that FM Alexander said that if people learned this, there wouldn't be war. Can you say more about that and why that would be the case? Yes. Now I'm going to pause while I wait for what I want to say, and I want you to notice how deep in thought I am. Mm. This is as deep in thought as you will ever see me. So I'm just going to do the other. Oh, yeah, I wonder how am I going to reply to this? Um, so tightening my neck muscles and my face muscles. Thinking is chemical activity in the brain. Um, are you interested in birds? There's um, a pair of magpies mm. and their fledglings out there. Mm. Mm. And the fledglings are like teenagers. Mm. If you're the parent, you have to feed the young ones. And then when they begin to feed, fend for themselves, you can go off and have another clutch. And the, the two magpies are sitting, they're like teenagers. Right, we've had enough food, what should we do? Oh, let's fly over to that branch. Um, just enjoying being in the here and now. Well, I, I, I went to, I said I went to a monocultural school in, in Wales, and um, I didn't meet anyone Jewish until I was 10. I didn't meet anyone Indian until I was 12. I didn't talk to anyone Black until I was 12. 
I didn't meet anyone who I knew was gay until I was 15. And my whole life has been a process of unothering. Mm. It's an ongoing process of unothering. And that has come from uh, my whole adult life has been a process of unothering, of, of questioning my beliefs. Uh, the, the, the process of, well, I have to do this to play catch. Oh, no, I don't. I can play it like this. And then we start to realize that all these other assumptions about things in life can be questioned. Hmm. Shall I say this? Someone I know of, you know, the division in Ireland, Northern Ireland and Ireland, someone in, it's a Catholic Protestant thing. Someone I know of Northern Irish heritage hates the Southern Irish. They were born here and have probably never been there. Hmm. They believe it because their parents told them. That kind of, um, if, if we all learn to think for ourselves, there would be less hatred. Mm. The happiness that comes about through Alexander, the enjoyment of the here and now. I found a paper, I'm quoting this in my new book, the majority of hate crimes are done by thrill seekers. If people were happier, there would be fewer hate crimes. If pe more people learned Alexander. And we, 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 I, I said about in, interpreting the world through, oh, when they said that, they meant it to be contentious. You meant that to be contentious. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Instead of saying, oh, you didn't mean it. Oh, okay. Does this sort of make sense? We, we judge the world how it really is instead of judging it through expectation and habit and what we've been told and stereotyping. It's very difficult to do stereotyping when you're, um, when, when you're an Alexander person. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental habit, like our physical habits, stereotyping is a mental habit. And, and, and um, getting people to talk to each other and... Um, um, talk to each other and um, and have less ego involved. I said something at a conference, I stood up and said something and someone, one of my friends said, sit down, we're dealing with this later. Hmm. But I wanted to say, no, she said, sit down, we're dealing with it later, we're experienced educators, this is not an appropriate time to say this. So I went over to talk to her and she said, it was inappropriate. You should have trusted. We're experienced educators. And I said, I don't need a ticking off. She said, well, you're going to get one. And she gave me a ticking off. And then she said, are we still pals? I said, yes, of course. We're Alexander people. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of makes sense. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. mm. I think ending wars is, um, you know, probably going, probably going too far. Mm. But... Um, yeah, it would make the, make the world a much better place if, if more people learned to question their habits, question their beliefs, question their opinions, question what they think is reality. Well, you, you have to do this to throw. You have to do this when you're cross. Oh, someone, I heard a prison visitor on... Radio for I think prison visiting is a charity thing that he said that um, someone who was doing murder, doing life for murder, had said, um, when I said to him, if you do that, I'll kill you. I didn't realize it didn't have to follow through. Now we're teaching people that they can make choices. Mm. We can change our mind that um, that it's okay to back down that kind of thing. I'm being vague about this. Read my new book. It's all in there. It's absolutely clear. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, do tell me about the second book. Uh, what's, I mean, you said it's about F.M. Alexander's books, but uh, how are you? I mean, I, I've not read his stuff, so I, I've heard rumors, so it's uh, impenetrable or difficult. So. Well, they, they aren't easy. Uh -huh. 
Um, but he, 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 the books have in them uh, opinions. I, mean, I think he touched on touched on eugenics. Mm. He had opinions about savages mm. and um, black people and Germans, mm. people from the Orient. He can, he came up with a whole backstory to explain what he discovered. Those can be ignored. He's got a load of endorsements from famous scientists and medics. Those can be ignored. I think he put those in because he was a country bumpkin from Tasmania who came to Victorian London, Edwardian London, and um, was a bit of an outsider. And he wanted to show that he'd arrived. And then there is what the work is about. There isn't much of that. And how these things that he discovered, I haven't told you what I think the three core things are, mm. how they would then benefit the world. Mm. And those are the bits. And nowhere in there is how to teach it. Mm. So, um, but the, the reason it's important is that um, the, the bits of the book, books that are worth reading, are saying something completely different from how the Alexander world sees the work. I would say the three things he's teaching are unity of mind, body, and spirit, um, uh, inhibition, learning to pause and make a choice before we carry out an activity, rather than doing the first thing that, the first urge that we've got. And the third thing is getting back accurate interpretation of what our senses are telling us. Mm. Mm. One of the classic things is um, people come in like this and they've done it for so long, they feel upright, even though they can see in the mirror, they're not. When I get them actually upright, this really happens. Sometimes they have to hold on because they feel they're falling over. Their curved thing feels upright. The upright thing feels falling over backwards. We misinterpret what our senses are telling us. Um, we, with negative hallucination, seeing things, that, not seeing things that are there. Walking into lampposts, there are fabulous videos online of people going along with their phones and falling into ponds and fountains. Mm. Um, accurate interpretation of what all our senses are telling us and the benefits of those to us as individuals and to humanity. Um, you know, you listen to a rant of a politician. Oh, um, Personally, I think Bill Gates didn't put a microchip in the vaccine. Um, and personally, I think that masks do work. I, I, I wear one, I'm, I'm still extremely clinically vulnerable. Um, uh, scientists look for evidence that they're wrong. Conspiracy theorists um, only look for evidence that they're right. And it, it doesn't it, it doesn't feel good to look for evidence that you're wrong mm -hmm. um you know questioning our beliefs and um and having an open mind about stuff this is all the stuff that i've regained from alexander i think i'm beginning to ramble mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, what, no, is, no. <laughs> what is the <laughs> sort of shape of the book that it's taking like how are you presenting it well it's um I, 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 no, it, sound, it sounds as if I set you up to ask me that so that I can say mm. this. Um, I'm tempted to, to get the, get the draft to it up. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do that because mm. it's a load of quotes from Alexander and John Dewey mm. that um, I met socially um, a, a leading psychologist in the British prison system. And we were talking about what we do for a living. And I said that I had got something that would help their clients. Mm. At times when I need it to, it won't recognize my fingerprint. It's like, why won't it? Why doesn't it recognize my... Why doesn't the face recognition work? Oh, yeah, I'm wearing a mask. New book. 
the, 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 the manuscript. Manuscript, September the 14th. I said I've got something. That, now, all these things are quotes from FM and John Dewey. I can teach the clients, that's the prisoners, an exercise in finding out what thinking is, the most mental thing ever discovered that would help them acquire conscious control of their mental and physical powers, help them stop and make a new choice before carrying out an activity, help them develop control of their reactions, help them quicken their conscious minds, help them be free from emotional gusts, and help them find within their minds the ability to resist, conquer, and then govern the circumstances of their lives. Now, if I'd given you that list earlier, we could have addressed each of those, and I could have told you how the work does. So I said that to the psychologist. They went home and looked it up online and came back and asked how was improving their posture and releasing their muscle tension mm. going to his clients, because that is how the Alexander world is presenting it to the world. The things I've read out was what FM said it was about, but we're presenting it to the world as release of muscle tension and, and, and posture and movement. Mm. And uh, one of the things I didn't say at the beginning is that I think I, in the biographical thing is I've been, um, I think I've, I've got, at, at the most I've got five years to live and I'm on a mission to wake the Alexander world up to what's in the books. Mm -hmm. So my new book is about how to read the books and how um, the things that the majority of us are teaching are misinterpretations of what FM was. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. As some traditional Alexander teachers, some traditional Alexander teachers do a lot of getting their students, clients, pupils to stand and sit. Mm -hmm. Now this is uh, what uh, a how, what we call a means whereby to learn about coordination and not focusing on the end, but living in the here and now, unity. I'm good. I want you to stand. Oh, okay. Well, look what you just did. And whatever it is, oh, if I can stand like that, then I can apply that to put, putting the kettle on. I can apply it to, I can, so it's learning about all those things. But I've met Alexander teachers who say, or I met an Alexander trainee who said, I've only been, only been doing this for six months and I still can't stand and sit properly. Mm. It's the difference between the finger and the moon. You know about that? Mm -hmm. Standing and sitting is the finger. Being fully alive in the here and now is the moon. Mm -hmm. Having control over one's life being fully conscious and making choices and therefore being in control of one's life. That's the moon. Mm. And I think probably in my experience, the majority of Alexander people have missed that. Mm. I look forward to taking a look at it when it comes out. Um, um, okay, it, it, it is planned for Alexander teachers. Because of Amazon's, um, you know, you buy things on Amazon, put something in your basket, and it says frequently bought with. Mm. So anyone who puts mindfulness in 3D in their basket, this is for beginners, mm. non-Alexander people, the other ones for Alexander people. Mm. It'll say frequently bought with, and I don't want beginners to buy them both. Mm. Mm -hmm. I want Alexander teachers to buy them both. So I need to call it something that doesn't have Alexander technique in it. Mm. And needs to be clear that it's for teachers. Mm. So I just got a long, slightly boring title so far, mm -hmm. and that is um, illusion or reality. Are we teaching what FM Alexander was teaching? Mm -hmm. That should put off, that should put off the uh, non-Alexander people. Yes, yes. Um, well, we've covered a lot of territory. Is there anything else you'd like to say or talk about? Uh, um, no, not that I can think of. Mm -hmm. But I did, uh, I did a talk for 
One of my trainees works for a charity, um, the National, this thing that used to be called ankylosing spondylitis, where the spine gradually fuses. They call it something else now, axial SPA, I think. And I did a demonstration there of how the Alexander work could help people who are stiffening work with that in a light and fluid way. And at the end, someone said, well, can you show us something practical that we can do for ourselves? Mm. I was, oh, yeah, that was a bit silly of me. I should always plan something practical to do. And that thing I talked to you through earlier. Oh, notice your contact with the chair. Yeah, yeah, but isn't that interesting where your eyes went? Mm. Look, I'm going to do a caricature of it, if I may, because no, you're not the only please. person watching this. I want other people. OK, notice your contact with the chair. Something like that, as if mm. somehow looking helped you. There's the chair. Go on. Yeah. I think I know what you're going to say. And in that case, I apologize. Well, no, I, how to put it? Um, uh, since you've made those interventions, I've been like trying to practice being dynamic. And so like, that's what I went to before I heard you talk about being aware of the chair. So okay. yes. The chair, the floor, the sounds, your peripheral vision, sunlight, bird song space behind this is what is this is what is the future isn't the past isn't this is what is now it would be so easy to go spiritual at this point and go oh yeah this is what is well this is what is we don't want to have what is in such a way that we can't move with us mm -hmm. so you or anyone else who's watching this you can you can play with this oh there it is and now i'm going to take it with me into my next activity rather than oh yes there it is yes it's all spiritual right i'll go and close the window mm -hmm. that whatever this is we can take it into activity mm -hmm. and another good bit of homework is to notice what i call phone zombies people who are going along like this i don't get out of the way for them on pavements mm -hmm. if somebody's walking at me like this i just stand still mm -hmm. It's my job. I'm teaching people how to be mindful. It's my job. They walk into these. I said that's called mindlessness. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> so that. Uh -huh. Yes. Experiment with mindfulness in action, not something you have to sit and do. Mm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so Are much for your time, Peter. Yeah, it's been do great. People really watch a whole two hours, 20 minutes. They do. They do. Yes. So I'll tell you what, any of you who get to the end, please write in the comments underneath. I got to the end. And then uh, I'll... <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So I see you that weekend in June. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping to come next month as well. So looking forward to that. And thanks for the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, speak to you soon. Mm -hmm.